Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his purpose. Today, I'll be sharing with you how God has worked through me to fulfill his, and I underline the word his, good works. So, how does God speak to me to fulfill these good works? Unfortunately, he doesn't really speak to me. I wish he did. I've imagined him having a voice like Sam Elliott or Morgan Freeman or even our own Lou Miller. But sadly, that is not the case. He doesn't even whisper in my ear. However, he does communicate with me. And each time he does, he takes me out of my comfort zone and forces me to have faith in him and to trust that indeed he will part the waters. You need to know a little bit about me to appreciate what God has to work with and why he probably chooses an unconventional method to communicate with me. I'm stubborn, I'm strong-willed, I'm a planner, I, um, I'm, I overanalyze everything, and I am not spontaneous. As I said before, God doesn't speak to me. But when he wants to communicate to me, it is very powerful. And what he does is that he literally puts words in my mouth. And then he parts the waters. Now, a little disclaimer here. I'm not saying that everything that comes out of my mouth are God's words, obviously. <laughs> But I know when they're not my words, because I'm usually saying, really, God? I'm going to tell you four instances where God put words in my mouth, he parted the waters, and then I'm going to share with you what the resulting outcomes were. I had a best friend from high school named Sherry. After her third child, she found a lump in her breast. She had a lumpectomy, a double mastectomy, chemo, and radiation. The last resort was a bone marrow transplant, which at the time was considered experimental, and Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Virginia wouldn't pay for it. The town of Colonial Williamsburg raised the $100,000 for her to have the procedure. She called me, ecstatic with this wonderful news. I was living in Dallas at the time. But there was one problem. Who was going to look after the children while she and her husband, Bill, were in Norfolk, Virginia, for her to have the procedure? The twins were 10, and Sarah was 6. And out of my mouth comes, I can do it. <laughs> that was my first, what I call, really God, moment. I had no idea how I could possibly make this happen. I didn't have three weeks of vacation, and this was in the days before working remotely with a laptop. And then God did his thing and parted the waters. About two weeks later, I walked into my office, and they told me they were eliminating my entire department. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> Work was no longer an obstacle. <laughs> I could focus 100% of my time and my energy on Sherry's children. And then I would fly back to Dallas and look for a job. I could tell you many funny things about <clears throat> that happened while I was head of their household. But suffice it to say, I earned the nickname BBB for burn, break, and boil. <laughs> Those three weeks have had the most unbelievable impact on my life. The children and I bonded in ways I never could have imagined, and our lives have become so intertwined. I consider them my children, but I refer to them 
as my godchildren. I have been to every graduation, wedding, burial, and baptism. I danced the mother-son dance at my godson's wedding, and my goddaughter's baby wore my family's 100-year-old christening gown when he was baptized. They have also been there for me. They flew in from Ohio for each of my parents' funerals. The rest of the story is that two days before I was to leave Colonial Williamsburg, I received a call from another division within the same corporation that I had been working for. They offered me a position which turned out to be a promotion and I would be able to save all my tenure from my previous position. I think of this as God making a sweet experience even sweeter by adding that cherry on top. A few years later, I received the dreaded phone call from Sherry's husband. Sherry was dying and her time was coming to an end and she was desperate to see me. Of course, I immediately got on a plane and went to see her. She was frantic because she felt like she had ruined her children's futures. The family had gone through all their money taking care of Sherry. She and Bill were both educators and put a lot of value into education. She asked me to promise her that I would see to it that her children had an opportunity to go to college. And through my tears I said, but of course. On the plane ride home, I said, really God? How are we going to make this one happen? The twins are 14. Four years is not much time to save up money to send not one, but two children to college, and I had Sarah waiting in the wings. <clears throat> Additionally, there were rumors at my company that we were going to relocate, and I hadn't wanted to make the move. But now, I felt like I had to if I was going to try to fulfill Sherry's literal last wish. And then God parted the waters. Out of the blue, I received a call from a headhunter about a position that I was interested in. Then the company announced, if you didn't want to make the move, they would give you a severance package. I immediately accepted the new position and took the very generous severance package, which became the beginnings of what we called the education fund. But I think God has a bit of a sense of humor because on my first day at my new job, I was told to go to personnel. And I'm thinking, surely they can't fire me on the first day. <laughs> you know, was I too aggressive in my salary negotiation? And they got, when I got there, they told me, oh, you get a signing bonus. So those monies were then added to the education fund. Thanks to the hard work of my financial advisor, some bonuses, part-time student jobs, and some scholarship money, all of Cher Sherry's children were able to graduate from college without any student debt. Between them, they have one associate's degree, two bachelor's degrees, and three master's degrees. They were able to fulfill their parents' greatest wish for them. I'm going to change direction a little bit here. I moved to San Antonio about six years ago to look after my folks. They were having more health issues and their greatest wish was to stay in their house and literally die in it. During a family meeting, God had raised my hand and out of my mouth came, I'll move to San Antonio. <laughs> On the plane ride back, I said, really, God, why now? I thought I was doing what you wanted me to be doing in Kansas City. I still had a year left to serve on the vestry, and I was volunteering with homeless veterans. These were things I thought God had configured for me to do. Why now? I came to San Antonio with a lot of trepidation, and if I were truly honest, I would tell you I dragged my feet. I didn't grow up here, so I didn't know anyone. 
It would be the first time that I'd be moving to a city without a job. I was used to living by myself and liked my own space. And I think most critical was I didn't believe I had the skills to be a caregiver, nor did I have the temperament. So I thought I would negotiate with God. I told him I would move to San Antonio as soon as my house sold. What happens? The first day the house goes on the market, there's a bidding war. I kept putting up barriers, and God kept parting the waters. It was very clear where he wanted me, and the sooner, the better. I will always cherish the time I had with my parents. And I thank God for making it possible for me to be able to give them the gift of dying in their own home. My dad died about three years ago and my mom this past June. And I understand that God brought me here to take care of them. But I think there's more to the story. I'm beginning to realize he may have also brought me here for my own well-being. The death of my parents has hit me hard, but God has put me into the loving community of Christ Episcopal Church. If my parents had died while I was in Kansas City, my Kansas City church family would have tried to comfort me. But they didn't know my parents. My healing is taking place because I am amongst you all who loved and cared for my parents and for me, and I thank you very much. People ask me what I'm going to do next. Am I going to stay in San Antonio? Am I going to look for a job? And I tell them, I will be where God wants me to be, doing what he wants me to be doing, when he wants me to be doing it. Which leads me to Snack Pack. When I first moved to San Antonio, as I said, I didn't know anyone, so my mother thought it would be nice if I had a friend or two. So she introduced me to Leslie Kingman. Leslie and I got together, and she was describing the Snack Pack program. She was gearing up for the second year of it at Lamar Elementary and was trying to expand the program to other schools. She suggested that Christ Episcopal Church adopt a school. And out of my mouth comes, sure, that sounds like a good idea. I get home, and I go, really, God? This is late July. School starts in August. I don't know anything about the schools in San Antonio. I don't know if this new church I just started going to would support it financially. And I don't know anyone to ask them to volunteer for the program. But God, this is your plan. And if you keep parting the waters, I'll keep following the directions. Being clueless as to how to get this program launched, I immediately called the church and was directed to Scott. He told me we already had a relationship with James Madison Elementary. We had our tutoring program and our music program. But best of all, the principal at James Madison was a member of our congregation, Barbara Black. Well, Barbara and I had gone to college together, so I was excited to renew our acquaintance. So I immediately called her up we got together, she was all in on this program. But we quickly realized we could not follow Leslie's model. We were going to have to create something very unique to make it work for James Madison and for Christ Episcopal Church. My next concern was money and volunteers. Snack Pack is now in its seventh year. Every time the ask has been made, you have come through and supported the program financially. And as for volunteers, I couldn't ask for a more loyal and dedicated group that comes together once a month to pack out the food that we send to James Madison. The mini miracle, if you will, is that we got this program launched in less than a month. Yes, we only started with 30 students, and yes, we continue to run into obstacles. But all along the way, every time we hit an impasse, I would hear, well, we'll make an exception for you. We'll make an exception. I think of that as God parting the waters. 
In November, we will be packing out 80 snack packs per week for the students at James Madison, and we hope that that will continue to grow. We also would like to grow our relationship with the students over there with some after-school programs like chess or cooking or Girl Scouts. We just finished the very successful school supply drive. And at Christmas time, we'll have our angel tree, where you can take an ornament off the tree to buy a pair of pajamas for a student. We learned that attendance is a problem right after the holidays. So to incent the kids to come back, they get to wear pajamas the first day. <laughs> the only problem is they didn't have pajamas. Now, thanks to you all, they're very excited to come back and model their new nighttime wear for their fellow students and teachers. Again, thanks to your generosity of both time and money, we'll be holding the Christmas extravaganza. We started this three years ago so that parents could shop for free toys that they selected for their children instead of strangers gifting their children. They get to wrap the packages and create their own gift cards. Two years ago, we started two more activities. No, it was last year. Sorry, last year we started two more activities. Um, under the direction of Ruth Berg, the children can go to a room and sing Christmas carols and do Christmas ca crafts. They go to another room and they get to shop for their parents with your re-gifted donated items. We wanted them to experience the joy of giving. At the end of the year, you very generously recognize students that have had perfect attendance by giving them a bike, a helmet, and a lock. You even support the students when school is out by providing scholarship money so they can attend Camp Capers and go on mission trips. You help out in emergencies. You have bought eyeglasses and beds, helped pay for rent and utilities, and you've even helped a mother and a daughter with their transportation costs when they needed to get out of town because they were in a domestic abuse situation. Thank you for everything you have done and all you continue to do. In closing, I'd like to share a quote with you that captures what I'm sometimes feeling when I'm doing God's work. And it comes from Mother Teresa. This is what she has to say. I know God won't give me more than I can handle. I just wish he didn't trust me so much. 